two words that do not belong in the same sentence. Gaming and Xeon. Now there are very, very few exceptions. See this video right here for one of those. I gamed on a 1230 V5, but only because I could base clock overclock. If it wasn't for that, the lower frequency of the Xeon processor just really wouldn't have competed with an overclockable i5 or an overclockable i7. But I have a 10 core Xeon here. Now that's 10 cores that can be utilized in games, although most games won't take advantage of all 10 because they're not optimized for all 10, typically around 3 or 4 is your sweet spot. But the core clock is so low on this chip that it just eats into my frame rate. You're going to see that in this video. Now, of course, we're going to need something with which to compare the Xeon as a sort of baseline. And in my last video, I benchmarked the 6900K against the 6700K, so I'm not going to bother including both of those chips because you have an idea kind of where those stand with each other in regards to just CPU intensive tasks in general. But I'm going to pit my 5820K, that's the CPU that's currently in Heisenberg, against this 10 core giant and see how much better or worse that 6 core 12 thread processor does when overclocked to 4.5 GHz compared to this 10 core processor with a significantly lower clock speed. Let's take a quick stab at the specifications for our test bench. This is my personal rig, so it's sporting two GTX 1070s from EVGA. These are not super clocked or for the win, so I had to manually overclock them to 1800 megahertz. They don't get much hotter than about 75C, at least the top cord doesn't get much hotter than 75C under full load. I'm also sporting 32 gigabytes of Trident Z DDR4 from G-Skill. These come in a beautiful white and silver array. You can get these configured yourself. Beautiful memory modules. The motherboard I'm using is an X99 Tai Chi from ASRock and the CPU cooler with which I use to cool both of these CPUs even though the Xeon, I mean that was severe overkill for the Xeon, uh, is an X62 from NZXT. This is a Kraken AIO. It's not released yet but you can find its specifications in this video description along with an update when it is released of where you can buy it. One last thing, we can overclock the i7, and I can't imagine why you would purchase a 5820K and not overclock it, so ours is overclocked to 4.5 GHz at 1.3 volts. It doesn't get much hotter than about 70, 72 degrees Celsius under full load in IDA64 after about 30 minutes. And for the Xeon E5 2630V4, well, I tried to base clock it as much as I could, and I got a whopping 50 MHz of additional boost out of it. Yeah, that was as far as I could go with that. So at least I at least I tried, right? And also, because we're running a Xeon in that rig with that configuration, I could only keep the DDR4 clock to 2133 MHz, not 3200 plus, which the 5820K supports. Even though the board supports it, the CPU itself won't allow the memory to run that fast. We're also not using ECC memory with the Xeon because that really wouldn't change any gaming result. And with that, finally, the moment you've all been waiting for, here are the gaming benchmarks. First up on our list is Dying Light. At 1440p in max settings, our i7-5820K definitely won this round 130 FPS on the average and 91 on the minimum. That's compared to 71 on the minimum for the Xeon 2630v4. That's a 20 FPS delta and about the same as well for the average frame rate. Dying Light is also a very optimized game as I've proven in my GPU vs CPU bottlenecking video and although the Xeon definitely has lower single core performance thanks to its much lower clock speed, it does a decent job at kind of staying in the game. Dying Light definitely doesn't take advantage of all 10 of the Xeon's cores. Up next is City Skylines, and this game for some reason only utilizes about three cores. The fourth core kind of lingers in and out, but every core after that pretty much stays at around 5-10% to CPU usage, which reduced the Xeon's advantage to nil. So we have 44 FPS on the average for the i7 and 39 for the Xeon. Not a big delta, but for a game like this that is definitely CPU bound, I do expect higher frame rates from both of these chips, being that this computer cost about 2300 US dollars. Cities also doesn't take advantage of SLI verified here, while GPU1's usage was around 70-80% to consistently, the second GPU really wasn't being used at all, so that also cut into our frame rate quite a bit. Third up, GTA 5, another game that I regard as highly optimized, and in 1440p we saw about 100 FPS on average for the i7, but a mere 65 for the Xeon. I was actually playing online with some friends yesterday and noticed that the Xeon's frame rate was significantly lower than the i7. It actually caused me to uh, turn off my 
computer and swapped from the Xeon back to the i7 for the sake of gaining those additional 40 or so frames. Now Witcher 3 is a bit different in that it's GPU bound, even though we have two GTX 1070s in our rig, so it really didn't matter which CPU we were using in this case, 78 for the average on the i7 and 75 FPS for the Xeon. This GPU bottleneck was identified by both graphics cards being utilized at near 100% during the entire benchmarking run, while our CPU usage remained well under 50% for a significant amount of gaming time. Total War Warhammer is an example of a DirectX 12 title in 1440p where the i7 pulled ahead by about 35 FPS on average. That is thanks to the i7's significantly higher clock speed being that Total War only utilizes to the max a single CPU core. You heard that correctly folks, Total War is stressing a single CPU core. And the Xeon fell far behind because its clock speed is 1.5 GHz lower than the i7 above it. Last up is Battlefield 1. Now many of you told me to benchmark in Conquest mode because that was so much more CPU intensive than Team Deathmatch. I honestly didn't see much of a difference at all between these two CPUs in that regard. Even the i7-5820K pulled out a 102 frame rate average, and the Xeon not far behind at 96 frames per second. Also keep in mind here that our minimums were literally within the margin of error. So what we've learned from these benchmarks is that core count really doesn't mean anything without the frequency to back it up. Our i7 only had six cores. That's still a lot of cores. That's uh, much more than the 6700K and that processor would give this one a run for its money. But even though we only had six cores compared to the 10 on the Xeon, hyper-threading on both processors, it still managed to outperform the Xeon in every single scenario thanks to its significantly higher clock speed. It might seem strange to some of you that a 10-core $700 CPU was annihilated by a $350 hexacore processor. But that's how most games work these days. Developers don't have the incentive to optimize games for more than four cores because most consumers only have four cores at their disposals. I like to use the console analogy for this example. Picture a PlayStation 4, right? It's sporting an APU, Jaguar cores, eight of them, although six or seven of them, depending on whether or not you unlock that seventh core, uh, six or seven are dedicated to specifically graphics and one core is dedicated to running the media interface, things of that sort. But that configuration for a PC would be severely underpowered, right? You'd be lucky to run some games in 720p at 60 FPS. 1080p, forget it. Most of the time you're not even going to have an enjoyable experience because you're going to have to drop so many settings to low, the game's going to look like trash. But because games are so well optimized for that specific platform, for the PlayStation 4 in general, they can boost the frame rate and resolution because developers know exactly what they're building and designing the game for which means that they can take advantage of the hardware to the max, whereas PC game developers pretty much have to keep an open mind and code very generally around their APIs because not every person has the exact same computer specifications. With that, if you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Give it a thumbs down if you do feel a bit opposite or if you hate everything about life. Be sure to click the subscribe button if you haven't already. Did you click it? Stay tuned for the next video, folks. This is Salazar Studio. Thanks for learning with us.